Good morning, Cornerstone family. We're so glad you're joining us for Church Online. Whether you're tuning in from out of town, in the car, or from your home in the Kansas City area, we're so glad you're joining us in worship. Thank you for bringing the Church Online. I'm excited to share a few announcements with you this morning. Our annual Easter Hunt-A-Trunk event is coming up on Saturday, March 23rd from 2 to 3.30 p.m. We'll have an inflatable obstacle course, an exotic animal petting zoo, rows of decorated car trunks with candy-filled eggs, face painting, and even a visit from Slugger. To make this event a success, we need your help. Sign up to decorate a trunk, serve snacks, help with parking, and more at cornerstoneks.org slash huntatrunk. To plan for Hunt a Trunk, our March mission focus will be plastic Easter eggs and wrapped bite-sized candy. Our goal is to collect 3,000 eggs and 13,000 candies. Place your donations in the mission bin by Wednesday, March 20th. Thank you for your donations. And lastly, on Friday, March 29th at 7 p.m., the Cornerstone Music Ministry will present selections from Song of the Shadows along with other Easter music. Invite friends and family to join you as we come together to witness the story of the resurrection. Please reserve your seat online at cornerstoneks.org concert. As always, these announcements and other resources can be found by scanning the QR code on your screen. Thanks for being a part of what we're doing here at Cornerstone. Good morning, church. Would you join me this morning for our call to worship out of Psalm 77? I will call to mind the deeds of the Lord. I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your works and muse on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have displayed your might among the peoples. Let us worship God. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together this morning. Well, our confession of sin is always a reminder that our sinfulness is uh, a way that we are kept from God. And without the remedy of Jesus, we would never have access to God. He has come to redeem us and forgive us for our sins. And so as we confess our sins this morning, let's be reminded of our great need of Christ. Let's recite this together. Holy Father, we call to you and name you as eternal, ever-present, and boundless in love. Yet often, O God, we fail to recognize you in our daily lives. We fail to love you with all our hearts or serve you as we ought. Rebuke us not in your anger, nor chasten us in your wrath. Heal us from our sin, for we are troubled. Deliver us for the sake of your steadfast love. Our sins trouble us, O God. We are troubled by how they have hurt others, and we are troubled by how they have hurt us. Your ways are right, O righteous God. And whenever we have refused to follow them, we have found out how right they are. 
Have mercy on us, O God, because of the perfect sacrifice of Christ Jesus, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. And now the good news is found in Christ, the assurance of pardon that he gives to us. It's from Ephesians chapter 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is wonderful news for us to hold on to and to cherish the beautiful work of Christ on the cross for our sins. Let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Oh, great and mighty God, we thank you that your word tells us the story that you loved us so much that you would even send your son into this world to experience torment and trial and evil upon him. He would taste all of that for us. And in so doing, he would take our sin and nail it to the cross, never to be counted against us ever again. And in that story, you have magnified your love for us. You've shown us and displayed the extent of your steadfast love for your creation. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you would provide the remedy that we could never provide for ourselves, that Jesus would be the one who would fulfill what is needed, and only he could do so. Well, so we thank you for the love that sent him into this world to die, that you would not leave us as orphans, you would not abandon us in our sinfulness, but you would provide the very way out from the sinfulness of our hearts. So we confess those sins before you this morning, Lord, knowing that our entertainment of them is following our own ways and not following yours. You've designed us to follow according to your pattern, to the design that you've given to this world. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help us by the power of your spirit to live according to your ways, to walk in holiness, to show our love for you in the way that we carry our lives. And that the gospel would seep down deep into our hearts. That it would affect the way we use our hands, our feet, the way we would use our tongue and our voice to speak to others and the actions and attitudes of our heart. Lord, we pray that they would be glorifying to you. That you would be well pleased in what we say and do. And our love for you would be evident in our love for others. Oh, Lord, how easy it is for us to not serve those around us. How easy it is for us to be self-centered and only care about ourselves. How easy it is, Lord, to love other things instead of loving you. But you've told us to love you with all of our heart. And you've told us to love our neighbors as ourselves. So, Father, we pray that you would enable us by the movement of your spirit in our life to do that very work. So that you would be honored. You'd be seen in our actions. You'd be seen in the, in the way we season our speech. And that we would be gentle and kind as the fruit of the Spirit works in our hearts to minister to the people of this world. We thank you that you bring people across our path each and every day. Lord, would you remind us that you've called us to be on a mission to serve as your people, to build friendships with people, to, to also share our story with people. To share the story of what you have done in our life. So we thank you for the marvelous grace that we've experienced, and may that then be used to tell others about the change, the transformation that's happened in our life. We desire to be a church that's on fire for you, that would share the good news with all of those around us. So, Lord, would you move in us today? Would your Holy Spirit give us the confidence and the courage and the boldness to go and proclaim Christ through our stories, through our friendships, and through our service so that you would receive all the glory. So we ask that you would build this church, you would continue to bless this church, and that you would continue to uh, move your church in this world for your good and for the building of your kingdom. So we pray that you would help us reach people, for we know that that's your design, that you would desire that none would perish. So we ask, Lord, that you would uh, use us and our stories, our, our broken lives, our hurt, our pain, and our sorrow for that very purpose, to magnify your works in this world for your glory. We pray this as your Son has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. that God has given to us a mission that each and every one of us who are followers of Jesus are called to be a reflection of Jesus in the world, to show what Jesus has done in us, to be used by the Lord to tell the story to others who don't know him, those that are far from the Lord, that the Lord would use you to possibly bring them close to him. And he uses your life, he uses your story, and The scriptures tell us over and over again that this is the responsibility of God's people. And so this is what we've been learning over the past few weeks. In 1 Peter chapter 3, it says this, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience. And there Jesus reveals to us what He wants us to do, that we would be ready at any time to be able to tell people who might have questions, just like you may have had questions before you came to know Jesus. And that the Lord used somebody in your life to speak to you who shared that story, who told you about the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And then many of you have come to him because of what people have shared with you, maybe someone witnessing to you, maybe someone preaching, maybe someone Speaking in a sermon on the internet or on television, the Lord has used all of these means to point us to Jesus Christ because the Lord has reminded us that he sent his son into this world to save and to seek the lost. That's why Jesus came, and this is what we are called to do now. And we're to share, to see and understand that the Lord would use our life to do so. We can do so much more than what we are doing right now in order to tell others about Jesus. So I'd love for you to think about that this morning. What else could you do? What more could you do to be able to tell this story, tell about Jesus to others? It's one of the most important things that we can do, and God has given us a mission to be fishers of men. That's what he said to his disciples. Come and I will make you fishers of mankind, that I will use you to bring other people to me. And that's amazing that God would partner with us and he would use our life, our story, our feeble ways of our life being used by God to be able to lead others to him. And that's what I find amazing. In Luke chapter 8, Luke tells us a story about how Jesus healed a man. And then he told the man to go back to his home and tell everybody what he had done for him. And in Luke chapter 8, it tells us that that man went back and he went throughout the whole town telling every single person what Jesus Christ had done for him. And there, Luke includes that story for you and me to understand that that's how God will use you. He will use you to be going throughout all of your neighborhood, your friends, your co-workers, whatever that may be, and he would use you to tell the story about what he has done in your life with anyone who is your neighbor, your co-workers, maybe even some of your family members. Anyone who comes across your path is a possibility for you to be used by the Lord to tell that story. So today we're going to look at the third style of sharing Christ with other people. We've heard of the first one was friendship building. The idea that some of you are wired that you can make friends very easily and the Lord might use your friendship ability and making ability to be making friendships with other people. And through that friendship, you're able to point them toward Jesus. You turn the conversation toward an opportunity to speak about spiritual matters. 
The second one that we looked at was selfless serving. And we know that God's wired some of you to be great servants. And through the way you care for people, the way that you might help someone in their need, the Lord may be able to use that, that example, as a way to also turn that conversation to tell them about Jesus, who has made you being that servant. And you're able to tell the world that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And you were able to use the way you're wired, the way that you're designed by God for that very purpose. And today, we're going to take a look at the third style, which is storytelling. See, every one of us has a story about what God's done in our life. I've shared my story many times with you about my dad preaching a sermon, my mom responding when I came home and had questions in my mind. She was ready in any season to be able to give a reason for why she believed and what she shared with me then led me to know Jesus Christ. And she told her story and she shared with me what the Lord had done in her. And so there's the opportunity that we have. We all have a story and what God wants you to do is to share it. It's that simple. To tell others it's a simple story of what God has done. What you have now become because of what Jesus has done in you. Your story can be used by God to lead your friends to follow Jesus. And we're going to take a look at a passage of scripture where the story of a man who was blind from birth is the means that the Lord would use to tell others about him. And he would go throughout his city and he would begin to tell and testify what Jesus has done. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd love for you to turn to John chapter 9. Now it's a long passage, but let's hear the story. Let's hear the the details that John wanted you to hear and for you to understand what he was doing and what God has done through this man's story. It goes like this. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi... Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud from the saliva. And then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. And the neighbors and all those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who was used to sit and beg, and some said, it is he, but others were confused and said, no, but it's like him. And he kept saying, no, I am the man. And so they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, and the man called Jesus, made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and I received my sight. And they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. And they brought then the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the man to the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I now see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. For he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner then do such things? And there was division among the Pharisees. So they said to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And he said to them, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? And his parents answered, We know that this is our son, that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. 
and he will speak for himself. And John inserts this little editorial note. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. And therefore his parents said, because they were afraid, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, oh, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. You see, the religious leaders of that day couldn't believe that this Jesus would be the the one that God would make the Messiah. They didn't believe that he would be used. And this story that is here, they see him not as an ordinary man. And so they would not want anyone to follow after him. That was their training. You should serve only God and no one else, never man. And because they did not believe in Jesus because their traditions, their design, their way to live their own life kept them blind to their own needs. But a blind man from birth who's sitting there is able to see who this Jesus is. And so this story is another way for us to look at ourselves. Do you see Jesus like the Pharisees do? As someone who's just an ordinary man, maybe worthy of learning his teaching and learning from him and maybe learning how to live a better life? Or are you able to see him as the blind man did? Because the story goes on, and I couldn't read all of the chapter for you, but it goes on to tell you that he fell down at the feet of Jesus and began to worship him because he understood who Jesus was. And he saw what Jesus had done for him. And he saw the transformation that was now happening in his life because of Christ. And so he saw him for who he truly was. How about you? You see, this story reminds us of the fallen world that we live in. It reminds us of the hurt and the pain and the sorrow that is so prevalent in our lives that we can't escape it because it's part of this broken world that we live in. And this world was not meant to be that way. But because of our desire to live according to our own ways, we brought sin into this world, and now we reap the harvest for it. We experience the pain and the sorrow and the hurt because we decided to not worship our maker, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who created you. And now our world is full of brokenness and fallenness. And the result is that people can be born blind. The result of this is that people can be born with disabilities. The result of this is that we see sin in so many different ways in this broken world. Our bodies break down. Our memory is lost. We experience the brokenness, the hurt, the pain, and the sorrow. And as they looked at this man who was born blind, they sit there and they wonder... What was the cause of it? And maybe you often ask yourself when you see somebody with an illness or maybe with a disability, you might wonder, what was the cause for that? And you might even think that God caused that to happen in their life instead of recognizing the fallenness and the brokenness of this world. And so when the disciples saw that Jesus saw the blind man, they turned to him and he said, Jesus... Who caused this? Did this man that's before us now cause his own blindness because of some sin in his past? Or how about his parents? Maybe they did something and now now he's the one receiving that kind of result. Now that's been questions that many of us do. I've met with many people in the hospital who said, I'm here because I know This illness is because of a particular sin that I did. Now, sometimes there might be a particular sin that you commit that's going to have repercussions in your life. 
You can think of what some of those are. If you choose certain ways to live your life and choices that you make, you're going to have consequences from those things. So you can see the direct correlation because of some of the choices you've made in your life. And now the hurt and the pain and sorrow that might accompany that. But Jesus wanted them to understand he wasn't going to talk about the causes. He doesn't answer that question for them. He tells them about the purpose. And he says to them, you're asking the wrong question. You should understand that this man's blindness is something that will be able to manifest the work of God in that person's life. And he begins to tell you about purpose and how God is able to make purpose out of the pain, the hurt, and the sorrow that you and I experience in this world. So that means that when we might have that news of cancer being in us, that God doesn't waste that in your life. That he's able to use it. He might have even a greater purpose. It doesn't mean that he's the cause that you've received it because of that. That's not what's there. You're receiving it because of the fallenness and the brokenness of this world. People will get cancer. People will get pulmonary arterial hypertension. But God may use it for the purpose of manifesting his glory and his power for the world to see how he carries you through the pain and the hurt and the sorrow. And he will use that story to make that manifest for all the world to watch and see what's going on. You see, this is a crucial reminder of God's power and might in this world. That all the evil that might be perpetrated against us in this world, God is able to make good come from it. Now, that's hard for us to grasp, but he's given us stories like this story, but he's given us many more in the scriptures. He's going to give you the story of Jesus Christ dying on the cross, a great evil perpetrated on the very Son of God, and yet the greatest power and work and might was seen in what he went through on the cross. Oh, they all intended it for evil, but God intended it for good, and he even tasted it himself. Or you can remember the story in the Old Testament about Joseph and a very dysfunctional family. We've talked about that story before, but we are reminded at the end of the book of Genesis, Joseph tells his family who have perpetrated all this evil against him, selling him into slavery, ignoring him, him having to live his life without his family connection, telling his father that he was dead. Imagine the emotional issues that that created in that family the distrust and the hatred and the jealousy that was rising up because that's what this broken world experiences. And yet, the t story tells us God wants us to hear what he was able to do. He was able to take all that evil that was happening in Joseph's life and he was able to turn it and use it for good. That's how powerful our God is. And so this story is a reminder of the power of God. He's able to take the hurt in your life and accomplish something good in it and from it. You see, the world's evil is not able to overpower the goodness of God and his graciousness and his mercy. God does not waste your hurt or your sorrow or your pain he will be able to use it for good. So he took this man's blindness and radically changed this person's life. Think about what it was like for him to be born blind. Immediately into poverty, he would never be able to have a job that would be able to give him the income to put food on his table. So in verse 8, it tells us that he became a beggar. And he was a well-known beggar because people, when they heard about him receiving sight, they're, they're sitting, isn't this the man that we knew who was sitting on this corner, maybe with a little placard that told us about how we could help him? Somebody would write the sign for him, and all he knew was to just hold it up and hope that people would read it. And then one day, Jesus walks by. He's invisible to the world, but he's visible to Christ. And you may be invisible to the world, but you're never forgotten by God. 
as you sit and contemplate what God is doing in your life and with your hurt and your sorrow and your pain, he wants you to hear this story. Because this is what God does in his people and for his people. He, he gives sight to the blind. And so he did this in the life of this young man. In his extreme poverty and thinking about every day, trying to ask for money from those that would pass him by so that he would be able to have food on his table and take care of his basic needs of life. His family obviously didn't care for him because he's now a beggar. They weren't taking care of his needs. He was even experiencing the abandonment of his family. And today, if you go to many third world countries, if parents give birth to children with disabilities, they often put them out on the streets because they believe that somehow a curse has come upon them. And that's what they've been taught in their culture. Well, and even in the time of Jesus, the disciples were taught a certain way that there's causes for the blindness, there's a cause, there must be some sort of sin in this man's life that created this, maybe in his past. And what past did he have? They would even believe that maybe in the womb he sinned, and so this is why he came out blind. They would also have been taught that, yes, maybe the sins of their parents would be passed on to their children. And so they wanted to blame the parents in that regard. You see, that was how the culture thought in that day. But Jesus said, no, I want, you to, I want you to focus on the purpose, not the cause. I want you to hear what God can do in your hurt and sorrow and pain. So there's a story in the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 4, where Jesus goes into the synagogue. And if you remember the story, he was given a scroll for him to read in the synagogue. And here's how that story went. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He's reading an Old Testament prophet. He's reading the Bible that Jesus had, which was all of the Old Testament. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. You see, this is what God has promised in his coming one, in his Messiah. He would be good news for the poor and he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering the sight of the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And when you read the story in John 9, this is Jesus fulfilling that Isaiah passage, what the prophet predicted about the one who would come and make all things right. He would give sight to the blind. He would take care of the poor. He would take care of those that are oppressed. He would liberate those that are in captivity. And when you begin to think about you and me, that's us. We're spiritually blind. We're impoverished in spirit. We don't get what God is doing in this world and we're blind to what he is doing and we're blind to our spiritual need and Jesus has come so that he would enable us all to be able to see. So who's really blind in this story in John chapter 9? It's not the man born blind. It's the religious ones who couldn't see Jesus for who he truly was. The prophet Isaiah predicted about him. They should have known that. They should have understood that. And you should understand that too with all the scriptures, all the sermons, all the small group studies that you've had over the past of your life. That You should too know Jesus very well from what you've heard and what you've seen if you've been part of this church for a long period of time. So Jesus, in this story, he spits into the ground and he bends down and he takes the saliva and mixes it with some of the dirt and he makes mud from it and he places it on the eyes of the blind man. And his friends would have helped him to go to the pool of Siloam and he would go there and he would take the water up with 
all the anticipation. Can you imagine what would be going on in his mind? Is this really true? Is this possible that I'll be able to see? I've been born blind. No one has had a cure for someone who's been born blind. Only God can give sight to the blind. And so when he gets near the pool and his friends help him get down and maybe they help splash water on his face and then he begins to wipe it away and he opens up his eyes and now he can see. Now John doesn't tell you about the reaction of that man. All he tells you is that he came back to town and he began to tell because people began to say, isn't that the, the beggar? Isn't that the man who was blind? But now he's walking, now he sees. He's got a beautiful smile on his face. Oh, have you watched any of those YouTube videos of people who've been given certain kinds of glasses when they were colorblind? I remember watching a man where his family bought this very expensive glasses that would give him the ability to now see color for the very first time because all he saw was black and white. And you can imagine what it would be like. Oh, we watched black and white television at one point in time, and now we marvel at 4K LED screens. 6K is on its way, and we're going to keep going up, but we begin to see the beauty of color, and we marvel at what God has done, and you can imagine what was happening in this blind man's heart. And all he could do is go back to town and say, I once was blind, but now I see. And it became his testimony. Your story can be used by God to lead others to Jesus. Your hurt, your sorrow, your pain, whatever your past has been, God has a purpose and he's able to take that evil and turn it for good in your life and even into the lives of other people. So each and every one of us has a special story of how God has worked in you and in your life. And he may use you today or tomorrow in someone else's life by you just simply sharing what God has done in you, just like this blind man would do. See, when the gospel changes you, it's a powerful story in somebody else's life. And the people that were in that town, as they saw this man come back and they hear the interrogation that goes on, you see the religious Pharisees, they want to not believe that this was a miracle. Maybe he wasn't even blind in the first place. Maybe he was conning us all the way, all the way along. So let's ask his parents, because his parents will probably tell us the truth. And so the parents come and they hear what the Pharisees are asking them to do. They're reminded that if they point to Jesus being the Christ, that they and their family will be put out of the synagogue, put out of the church, excommunicated, never to be allowed back in. Their social standing would be ruptured. And what happens, the parents who weren't taking care of their blind son in the first place didn't care enough for him either. And they said, well, you ask him instead. They passed the buck. And so then they ask the man to come again. They've asked him multiple times, what has happened to you? Who has done this? And he tells them, I don't know who he was. His name was Jesus. Maybe he's a prophet. But all I can tell you is I once was blind, but now I see. And over and over again, the people heard that testimony. And it began to shake the blindness in their own eyes. And John inserts this story in this gospel so it will shake your life to see the manifest power of God's work in you and in this world. So in John 9, verse 24, it says, So for the second time they called the man who has been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And they're referring to Jesus. And he answered, Whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is this, that though I was blind, now I see. He shared his story of what happened to him. And the powerful change that came upon him. Ray Steadman said this. He's a preacher in San Francisco, if you remember Ray Steadman, back in the Jesus Revolution days. If you remember that movie, well, Ray Steadman was one of the leaders in the Jesus Revolution movement, leading his church in Palo Alto, and he wrote this. That, that is one of the greatest models of how to bear witness as a believer. 
Many people are afraid to say anything about the Lord because they think they'll be dragged into a theological argument that will be over their heads, maybe. But witness is simply doing what this man did, saying what Jesus did for you. That is all. Once I was blind, now I can see. That is what a witness is. You are the world's greatest authority on what happened to you. As someone has well said, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with only an argument. And when you stand on your experience, no one can deny what the Lord has done in your life. You are a positive, powerful witness for Christ. This man teaches us great things in that regard. See, that's what the scriptures call you and me. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. There's the mission that God has given to you and to me and to this church, that you will be bearing witness. You will go and just tell the world what Jesus has done in you because you're an expert in you and what God has done in your life. I don't know if you've ever heard of Lee Strobel. He's written many books for you to enjoy. He wrote a book called The Case for Christ. But did you know his story? Lee Strobel was an atheist. He went to Yale Law School and was in the top of his class. He became the legal editor for the Chicago Tribune, a major newspaper in the Midwest and in the world. And so he would investigate cold cases. He would investigate different things. He would write up the stories. And he was a great cynic and he married his college sweetheart. And they moved to Chicago, and he begins this beautiful job that he has. And one day, his wife has a relationship with a friend that's a nurse, and this nurse was a Christian. And this nurse begins to tell her story about what happened in her life to Lee Strobel's wife, whose name is Leslie. And Leslie had this influence by this nurse over and over, and this nurse kept asking her, would you like to go to church with me? And so she began going to church, and Lee would stay at home. But she began going to church, and she began to hear the gospel, and she witnessed what was happening in this person's life, this nurse and her constantly telling her about what had changed in her life, and Leslie finally became a follower of Jesus. And so one day when she had enough courage, knowing that Lee was an atheist, she went home and said to him, I have now become a follower of Jesus. And his jaw dropped. And he said the very first words that came to his mind was divorce. Surely I need to divorce this woman now that she's become a, a fool. And in his anger, he took the lawnmower and went into the backyard. And the new garden that his wife had just planted, he mowed it all down to show her. And then he began to think as he was out there mowing through the flowers. He began to think, well, maybe, why don't I show how foolish this Christianity is? And he began a journey that would take him two years to try to disprove Christianity. And he said, the the heart of Christianity is the resurrection, so I'm going to disprove the resurrection. That's going to be easy for us to do, isn't it? And so he began to, as he's an investigative journalist, he begins to call people on the telephone and ask them about their understanding about Jesus and the resurrection. And as he begins to call these experts that he's learned about and calls them to get their information and hear their story, he begins to see and hear the testimony that Christians have about the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he begins to hear the testimony of what they're able to tell him. And so he thought, well, certainly this Jesus never died. Maybe it was just a way that he became unconscious and that sort of thing. And then he began to read a journal called the Journal of American Medicine or the Medical Association, JAMA. And in that year, they had written an article about the certainty of Christ's death in the cross. And they laid it all out in this journal article that was printed 
there, about 10 page article, and he began to read it and he began to see, well, these experts that understand death and dying said they was absolutely certain that Jesus died. No one survived a crucifixion. And when you begin to read history and the history books, it tells you that there was not one testimony of a person who lived through a crucifixion. They all died. And he began to hear other testimony that these people that saw and witnessed it, there were over 500 people that were able to hear that Jesus had appeared to them. And he begins to listen to that testimony. He begins to listen to all of these stories. And he thought these stories were legend. Something that was written far back. And when he begins to study 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and Paul describes the, the power of the resurrection, that if we, were, we would be all still in our sin if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And he realizes that that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is actually a creed, a, a form of a creed of the early church. And he investigates that that creed had been written probably months after Jesus had resurrected from the grave. And he begins to see that the many things that he had in mind about Jesus were not true. And these stories that he thought legend may not be. And the Lord continued to work on him over these two years as he continues to do this. And he begins to see that this story about the resurrection was rooted in eyewitness testimony. It was passed along by reliable people throughout the centuries. It was confirmed by archaeology. It was confirmed by outside testimony, the people that wrote about Jesus and what had happened to him. And all of this evidence mounted up and he began to see that the documents that make up the New Testament are reliable and something that is trustworthy. And as he sat and listened to all of this testimony, his wife asked him to go to church with him. And he went to church for the first time and as he sat there in the church, he came home and he realized... He has an enormous amount of testimony that he has before him, and it's now time to reach a verdict. And that Sunday afternoon, he sat in his office, and he said, that I began to see that it would take more faith to be an atheist than it would be to believe in Jesus Christ. And his wife came to him and shared a verse that she had been using to tell about her story. It's John 1, verse 12. John said, but to all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. And as Lee heard those words, he said, all I have to do is to believe, and then I can receive Jesus, and then I can become a follower of him. And he got down on his knees, and he confessed his need for Jesus Christ. And she had prayed for him for two years, knowing the hardness of his heart, knowing that he was a devout atheist, and she thought there was absolutely no way Lee Strobel is going to become a follower of Jesus. And so when he had the gospel take root in his heart, it changed everything about him. His co-workers thought, there's no way this is going to change Lee Strobel. But he went into work and began to say, I'm now a follower of Jesus. And they were shocked because they knew him as a drunk at the office parties, drunk on the weekends, coming home. Even his five-year-old daughter witnessed his drunken tirades. And because of the change that she saw in Lee Strobel, she went one day to her Sunday school teacher as a five-year-old, and she said, I see what God has done in my dad and how he's been changed. I want the God that he has. And she shared that with her Sunday school teacher at the age of five. And you begin to see how a simple little story Someone sharing their faith. A nurse who was bold enough to speak to her friend and tells about what God had done in her and then it changes his wife and then his wife changes him and he changes his daughter and today his children are followers of Jesus and married and now in the ministry and he's been in the ministry for 30 years. 
The Lord radically changed him. He was blind, but now he sees and he shares his testimony around the world. You can go and watch it on YouTube and hear the story or you can read the book, The Case for Christ, that tells his story. You see, you have a mission that God has given to you to be fishers of men. So simply telling others about what Jesus has done for you is what God is calling you to do today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these stories that we see in the Bible that tell of your mighty work and power. And we thank you that that same story has happened in all of our lives that are followers of your son. So Lord, we pray that you would use us for that very purpose, that through sharing stories, the whole world will see the beauty of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone. I've been set free, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy rings, unending love, amazing grace. our story, the way our life has been manifested, the way our life has gone, all the things that have been part of our life, including our pain and our sorrow and our hurt, that the Lord can use it for good in this world. And that through our story, many would come to know who Jesus Christ is. And we all know that we can do more than what we're doing right now. And so, Father, we do ask that you would do that work in us as we leave this morning. 
And would you as God's people hear the good news that is found in him and found in Christ and the strength and the empowerment to do that very work of telling that beautiful story of what God has done in your life with others. May you go empowered to do that very work. Now may the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you now and forevermore, empowering you to tell your story of what God has done in you simply and plainly and boldly before a watching world. Go and be used by God's people and for God's people in this world. God bless. See you next week.